Hey guys, what's good? It's the NRL Fantasy Fanatic coming at you with round number three. Reporting from a disappointing round number two as we recap what went well for our team, what didn't go well, what are my concerns, what are the trades I'm looking at, as well as potential trades for your team, and what is happening at the top of the scoring board. Who is number one? What is their team doing well? Is there anything we can pick up or learn from them this week? So starting from the top, um, not everything went to plan across my team. Uh, not a lot of players met their usual average, especially uh, quite a few of my guns, which is super unfortunate. Now, we expected a good score out of Randall. 45 is still extremely solid for the price point that he's at. Bullimore, 20. A little bit disappointing. We kind of want a lot more out of Bullimore, but it is what it is. He had less minutes. The Manly Seagulls only scored one try. Roosters really dominated them in, in terms of attack and field possession, similar to what the Penrith game was for them in round number one, so hopefully we can get a little bit more out of Manly this week, as well as Bullmore as a direct result. Josh Curran always does a great job, 59, probably around the price point that he is um, currently paying at. He didn't do anything over the top. He was heavily involved in the game against the Titans. Payne Haas, we wanted a little bit more out of. He did get 58. Happy with that. It was a much better captain's uh, choice than the last week's choice that I had, but... I would have liked to have seen a higher score, uh, given that he's over 800 gram. But again, you can't always, you can't always get those scores um, through the roof. But as a base, 58 is still extremely solid. At least it's not someone who got 30 or below or became injured during the match or had a HIA. Angus Crichton was extremely well. I'm going to say this: extremely disappointing for rounds one and two. He's just not the same Angus Crichton that we saw popping off the page last year. It doesn't, he doesn't seem to be involved in the attack as much or providing those much needed fantasy points from you know, his well-trademarked um, handoff and, 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 um, and so forth. So we're a little bit concerned around him this week because he has been named on the interchange, which is actually really bad. We don't know how he's going to fall into the squad. Will he be moved into the center? Will he just be, be replacing the left or right hand edge? Either way, it's... Probably not a good position to be in if you're um, holding him as a fantasy coach. I'll be looking to trade him this week. In fact, he's one of the trades that I've already made. Is what it is. David Feeder had reduced minutes um, to about 60-odd 60, 60 minutes uh, this week, which is a bit surprising because the Warriors um, only trailed by <clears throat> less than one try. Pretty much most of the game, you would have thought he got a, would have got a lot more ball. Firma really um, was the star edge player in that game for the Titans. I will say this though, and I said this in in my second week video, when I went, when I went and watched the Parrot Eels play the Titans, Fafita was hanging out in the wing, just catching his breath back and not being involved. And I don't know if he's going to get a spray off the coach to get more involved, to play more in the center, to be more in the attack, more in the line. Um, or if he's just not fit this year, he's not fit like he was in the prior year. I'm not really sure. It looks a little bit concerning. I don't think he's a trade just yet. I wouldn't be moving him around. We're going to get those low scores in some weeks with our guns. It is what it is. Kurtman only getting 30. Kurtman actually played really well against the Tigers and seems to have cemented his spot at 13. The only problem is he's a lock that loves to catch and pass. And that's not necessarily good for us fantasy coaches because we want to see a lot more ball running, a lot more attacking stats, the tackle busts, the offloads. It's just not happening for our man. Amon, geez, Amon got a little bit found out in the weekend. He was up against Kikau in in defense, and he just seemed to have gotten steamrolled a few times um, from the bigger man versus the littler man. Ben Hunt definitely has a much tighter wrap around that team as opposed to Amon. I was a little surprised that Amon did get 27. He was at negative one or negative two for the first 15 minutes, and then... Gradually, points started to come up. He's definitely still a hold because he's only 342 base. I wouldn't be trading him just yet. Maybe the coach might get stuck into him a little bit more to get involved. We'll have to wait and see. Eichenberg did a good, solid job for me in the centers. Would have liked to have seen a higher score. 40, 47, can't complain. Although, we didn't go the route of Tago in Crichton, which a lot of you other coaches have done. And going with that center position with those two players is paying you dividends. Cheaper players in your squad, filling those holes, getting higher scores, it's pretty much shredding me down. It's it's one of the biggest uh, deal breakers for me this season. We're going to have to see if that will kind of um, 
average out over the year. But for now, obviously, I can bird, stick him at center. They're going to do the job. Get him in there. Get him pumping. Papenhausen, 34. Again, pretty average score for a, a fullback. Just wanted to see more involvement. And against South, the game was pretty disappointing. I mean, the first 15 minutes, they dominated it. Then the 50 minutes following that, it was kind of like neutral stalemate. And then the last 10, including extra time um, against South, they dropped the ball. They just couldn't get out of their own half. They kept making errors, mistakes, knock-ons, uh, anything and everything to bring the Rabbitohs back into it. They just couldn't do anything about it. The Hammer, 31. Look, I can't be disappointed because he did get a reasonably high score in the, in the week before. We're not always going to get good scores out of our fullback, especially if um, the Hammer's a bit of rocks and diamonds. He's always been like that. It is what it is. James Sesco, he's back. 63. Totally great. Excited. Um, whether he will score that week to week, we're not 100% sure, but he seems to have been involved. Maybe the last training session, they worked on a few different plays, brought him in. He looked really... He looked like he was on fire, hitting the right lines, um, getting a couple of try assists in there. Um, it did help that they did demolish um, the Manly Seagulls, but... I think you'll find the injection of Teddy week two can probably be mimicked in week three. Uh, Maxi King did well, 55. Can't complain. Bench player coming in. He's doing the job for us. He's a cashy and potentially someone who could maybe not necessarily fall into a keeper at the tail end of the season, but the midriff of the season, we tried to like massage our team out a little bit. He's doing a great job. Schiller was super disappointing, but so were the Raiders in general. And it's hard for wingers to score in any team that gets absolutely pounded. Tuolagi is out this week. Um, huge concern. He had a HIA. Obviously not a trade out. The fact they only scored 18 was a little bit concerning, but you know, you're gonna have to take that. Lachlan, 18 again. Not a great score. It, I'm not sure what, what's going on in that Rabbitohs team. I know that he wasn't gonna be a replacement for Adam Reynolds, but I was expecting a little bit more spark, and I think a lot of people who picked him up which is more than one-third of you, also thought the same thing. Billy Ward was off the bench. What do you know? Actually had a, a, a quite a good impact in the team. Fresh legs, running in. Um, he just... He does so many things well for fantasy, and, and a lot of that's when he runs sideways across the field and he starts just slapping or palming off hands. Kind of like what Tedesco has done over the last three years, and he gets those easy tackle bust um, stats. But having fresh legs wasn't a bad mix for Billy. He just came in and he pumped away. Leo Thompson, now his minutes were dramatically increased because of the injuries in that squad. 45 was a great score. Unfortunately, I was a, hmm, unfortunately I was originally going to loop the emergencies through, but I decided to go against it, which meant that I got st stuck with Lachlan's score. Definitely next week we'll be looping some other players because we do have Koala still out as well as Tulagi and Schiller. Schneider, we know that he was out by covid Frawley doesn't look to be uh, a threat to his position, so he's back in the squad. We're definitely going to be holding him. But the trades I was looking at this week kind of came down to two things. I need to pick up Akashi, who's doing quite well, and cemented himself a spot in his squad and also most fantasy squads. And to do that, I needed to sell one of my guns. And the only gun and downgrade one of my guns. The only gun I could really think of doing that with was Angus Crichton. The reality is, he is going to interchange. He may come out and pump a 50 or a 60 from the interchange bench. We're not really sure, but the signs don't look promising. Everything that kind of points to the fact that he won't be doing that um, in the next couple of weeks, um, in terms of those big scores and potentially turning around his early season uh, charade, doesn't look likely. So for me, he's a sell. Potentially a buy post-Origin. He'll most likely play for the Blues. Coming out of Origin, if he gets that starting spot back in the Roosters, totally could be a buy depending upon how they're going to play him. Now, he could only just go to the bench for one week, but it just seems extremely suspicious why they've named Nate Butcher of all people to replace him in that spot uh, unless things, unless the coach wants to try things which seems to be the case, or they don't like what Crichton's currently dishing out at the moment. So, for me, he's a trade-out, which means I'm going to have a bit of cash um, to splash in other areas. And so, 
if I bring up my photo of my trades post my team, it was basically trading uh, Angus Crichton into Tago. Now, this goes against everything I've generally been um, been going for. My videos, my entire fantasy career is that I just don't like picking centers to play center. Primarily because even the highest scoring centers, like a Dane Gagai, Dane Gagai is absolutely killing it right now. But Dane Gagai can have those games where he might only score a 10 or a 15. I hate that lower threshold that centers can just get because you just never know. You never know. They're not... They're not going to give you great base stats because they're not always defending, in the you know the defending on the right side of the attack. They might because they're going to be defending on the side. They may just not get involved. But I have to eat my words here. I think Tago at four hundred twenty-seven thousand dollars, covering the edge and center position, it gives me cover on both spots, which is good. He's kind of proven himself as someone who wants. To be involved, even when the the ball's not coming out to him, he's looking for the ball in the middle to get a couple of hit ups, and he's good for a tackle bust here or there. He also has a good offload. He's a bit of a bigger boy, bit of a bigger body in the center spot. He's still young, um, albeit the fact of his size. But what that means is he's just going to be able to get easy attacking stats. And I've made mistakes before in prior um, fantasy seasons where. I just neglected to trade into someone because I thought the boat had already sailed. The reality is, it's only week two. The break-evens this week, if we pull them over from this page. The break-evens this week tell me that he's priced at you know, the break-evens three. So, he still has good money to go up. The question will be, is he able to sustain um, solid fantasy scoring? Maybe not, but I just don't want to miss out in that spot. We know he's going to be playing 80 minutes week in, week out. There's no threat of anyone coming in. He'll most likely be good origin cover as well because quite a few of his teammates will be picked for New South Wales and also Queensland, and he won't be. So I think he's kind of a, a have, to, have to go to at the moment. He is cost. Um, he is costed like a bit of a mid to high tier center price, but I just don't want to, I just don't want to miss the boat. And it sucks because it goes against everything I want to do. And I kind of like dwelling on that point a little bit. And I won't be surprised if I pick him up and next week he gets 10 or 15. But the promising signs are there. The attacking stats look good. The running in the middle, um, trying to bring it out of his own half looks good. And that's what I'm looking for with my centers. Not every center does that. Patego definitely does look to be involved more than any other, more than most centers out there. And, and so he's not just relying on getting the ball outside of his half or in an attacking spot down his side of the field. So I brought him in. And the other trade that I want to do was Starling. Now, we saw the sad news that Hodgson was going to be out for the rest of the season. Um, on the bench this week in Canberra, they've named Frawley, who is a bit of a utility player, will most likely come in for Starling at some point. Even though Hodgson, it can be an 80-minute hooker, we know last season, Havili, he always brought him in. Ricky really, 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 really likes playing two hookers and giving that fresh legs running through the middle. Starling, we know, can definitely play um, the full the full um, 80 minutes. We, we, we've seen his performances before when he's had to. Um, but the reality is, Tom Starling um, is a good fantasy scorer when he starts at the hooker spot. Just looking at the NRL, NRLfantasystats.com, if we look at his time at hooker, that's starting. He doesn't always get 80. Some of it's 70, 78, 72, 57, 70. But if we take that average, it's 55.8. Now, we know his break even is 25 because that's what it tells us, which means he has price to go up. The consolation prize of me moving out a gun, which is Angus Crichton, into um, two other positions and trading up one of my weaker squad players or someone who's not playing. In this case, I decided to trade up Schiller, who looks to have been permanently replaced by uh, Rapida and Kotrick, um, means that I've had to fill that spot with someone who I believe 
this week, next week, and for a few more weeks, will score well. Do I think Starling will outscore Angus Crichton? I actually do. I think the stats are there. It, it, it shows a promising sign. Now, he only played the 57 minutes last week. He only scored 38. But I think the 57 minutes is worst case scenario, right? Like, yeah, there was one other time he only played 53, but that will be depending upon a few things. How fatigued is he? How how urgent is it for Ricky to bring in another hooker to run those meters? And you've got to remember, with Frawley being a, a bit of a utility player, if a winger or a center or a fullback goes down, Frawley will most likely be the man to fill in for that spot. So Starling will naturally get that 80 minutes. Starling doesn't need the 80 minutes, but it would generally help. Just... At, at stats across the page, but I really think that um, Sterling will outscore Crichton, so that's kind of my justification. You always should justify your trades. You shouldn't just making be making trades for the sake of one low score or two low scores in a week. There's got to be a justification behind it. And so for me, Angus Crichton moving from the starting spot into the bench just throws up way too many question marks for a gun that I need to be delivering in order to. Uh, propel me up the leaderboard. So I brought in Starling and uh, Tago. My two tradeouts were Angus Crichton and also Schiller. That gives me a hundred. Um, when I did the trades, obviously this is in Photoshop. It's about 107k left. So I've still got money up my sleeve in case something bad happens in the next week. If someone else goes down, um, I can definitely do a couple of trades. Um, that aren't necessarily deploring my team too much, but I can potentially trade someone up uh, just for a little bit of a, a price hike as well. So it's kind of covering myself in a few different bases. And I, I, I think um, that's the best way to go for myself, given the team that I've got and given the way we've kind of started. And, and in my bench, I'm going to be starting um, this squad, uh, but I'm going to have my fourth um, player as Koala. And that will mean that I can rely on uh, Thompson score, Leo Thompson score, because they play before uh, the Broncos. And if I feel that that doesn't work, I can bring Billy Walters into Koala's spot and then capture Billy Walters score. I'm going to decide to put Lachlan um, on the bench permanently as an emergency just at the moment. It's not necessary for me to make the trade just yet. We, You've got to give him another week. It's just the hold. Like, what's the worst case scenario? He may lose a couple of more thousands of dollars. I'm not overly worried about it. We'll see how that plays out. Torlagi, for me, is someone you've got to hold as well. He's only out for one week as far as we know with that head knock. He should be back. Yes, he only scored 18. It is what it is. But we were kind of expecting him to go up in price anyway. So why would you trade out a cash cow now? Uh, looking at the rankings, if we look at team number one, always like to do this just so I can get a vision of, of what this team is doing well. What are they doing bad? Is there anything we can learn from them? Are there, are there any players that we've just missed out on? So if I can commentate on Robbie B, who, by the way, if you're watching this video, what well, very well done to yourself, mate. It's a good job to be at the top. So he's got Randall, which I think you'll find most um, competitive coaches will have. He's got Haas as captain. Seems to be a lock. Jai Arrow, for the obvious reasons that he's moved into the center more. Potentially more minutes. 45. Pretty pretty good scorer on his part. Um, he did get that earlier 60 in round one. Tapine, he's obviously gone for a bit of a pod um, with Tapine. Uh, yeah, I mean, it could be better. It could be worse. He did score, what, 50, 49 in the first week. Again, average price player getting those scores that are probably around that mark. Nane. Mate, um, I kind of missed out on Nane, but again, he got 17. I remember saying in my first week's video, I, I didn't go with him in the first place because I just found that he made way too many missed tackles, and missed tackles can just bite you in the ass. Now, he is still coming of age. I believe he's only 19, which means in the next couple, in, yeah, maybe even this year, he might not have as many missed tackles. But for me, I was a little bit of the danger zone, missed opportunity. It is what it is. Could I have taken my time time back and gone him instead of Amon? 100%. Kurt Capewell went huge in the first week. He got that field goal, so it boosts up his points. 34. That might that might actually be his score moving forward. And then we've got Cherry Evans and Burton. Burton seemed to be everywhere for the dogs. Even though the dogs didn't score all that well, he was just involved. He was the dominant half. He was kicking. 
We know how much he loves to kick, and he kicks a big... He, he just gets... He, he clocks easy meters. He loves to run. He's just that all-encompassing half. You know, a jack-of-all-trades half. He's just looking to set up other players for a bit of a line break or a try, and also get that big kicking meters, but also runs himself. So a little bit of that unpredictable nature means he can just contribute more points uh, just by catching other squads off, off, um, off guard. We've got Iken, who's solid. Again, a lot of people will have him in his squad. Tago, so he's done the right thing there. Nico Hines is a funny one. Scored 84 in week two. Will we expect to see that again? You know, watch this space. Have we overlooked Nico Hines? Potentially. I always had that theory that being a Melbourne player, your scores are usually bolstered a little bit more than what they are in other teams. Doesn't seem to be the case, at least for week two. Um, obviously, I can't trade him in now because I've got my halves set up as they are. It's unfortunate. Stephen Crichton, again, he's just done the right thing. He's just got the right player there. Um, Stephen Crichton is kicking goals for the team while Nathan Cleary's out. He's he scored a scored reasonably well in the first round, if, um, if my memory's correct. Fifty-seven, if you're looking at that. Rocco Berry was um, an interesting one. I think there was a few other options. Again. Critiquing someone else's squad is always easier because it's all hindsight when you're looking at it from week to week. Like, yeah, maybe there could have been a player that did better. Of course there would have been if you're just looking for the most optimized squad. It's an interesting one for sure. Um, it looks like Rocco's... Sorry, Robbie's definitely gone for a couple of pods. Uh, players of difference. Generally, players of difference are anyone more than 10% or less ownership because... They have the largest impact on your squad. And so if your pods do really bad, you'll go down quite quickly. But if your top pods do really well, especially in a position that didn't score that well um, overall for other fantasy players, and you're just absolutely killing it, um, you can possibly get more points. But yeah, Rocco Berry getting 29, averaging 28.5, probably where he deserves to be, but seems to be doing a good job. Uh, Wilton, now he's out, he's averaging 61 points, he scored really well in the first two weeks, unfortunate for the suspension, Bullimore, same story, we had Josh King, solid, solid pickup, not a lot of people would have had him in round one, because of the whole, um, Harry Grant coming back in the squad, but then Brandon Smith got injured, now Harry Grant's got COVID, it's like he's got the full-time spot, for all we know, it could be a bit of a circus for the remaining part of the year, and he'll just end up, um, playing that starting spot. Um, in the perfect world, he doesn't. Eventually, when Brandon Smith comes back, and Harry Grant, or supposedly, see how that plays out. Maxi King, uh, what else do we have here? Davey Mural is, ah, uh, 25%. He was another one of those players that was on the fringe of being picked up by one quarter of squads out there. It seems to be unfortunate that he's not named again. Panasini, another solid pick. Walters, Schneider. So, Robbie's actually done a really good job. He's got, he's got, Good enough guns. His mid ranges are absolutely popping off, and his cheapies are going up in value. So Robbie seems to be set, and that's the thing about scoring well in fantasy is that it it just remedies any or all problems that you could have. If your team's scoring well, why would you need to make trades? Um, you would just cherry cherry pick the players that have uh, completely um fully cashed out from their starting position, from their starting uh price to now what they currently are, but. That's, that's the beauty, and so for me, I'm trying to make some dramatic changes to kind of get that score back up. Hopefully, I can make my way back up the table. This has been the NRL Fantasy Fanatic for round number three coming at you. Come back at you with round number four. Hopefully, we pull it back a little bit, and I'll see you next time. Whoosh.